everybody, in this video, I'm gonna go over the top five hardest maths questions that you will find in the Key Stage 2 SATs reasoning papers. Now, you might disagree, you might think there's some harder ones, but for me, these are my personal favorites from over the years, as I think they just require some really good problem solving skills to solve. So let's dive straight in then to the first problem. And this is from the 2023 SATS paper, so the most recent SATS paper at the time of recording this, and this is, here's what it says. Here is a regular hexagon. The area of the large shaded triangle is double the area of the small shaded triangle. What fraction of the whole hexagon is in the shaded area? So great question. Every time I give you a question in this, in this video, you can have a chance to pause and see if you can solve it yourself first. And then I'm going to hit you with my solution. So pause the video. Do you know what the answer is? This is a great question because there are a couple of really simple ways to solve it. I'm going to show you those right now. So first of all, this information shows us that this top part here, this little triangle, is exactly half of the bottom one. I could put a line through here and turn this bottom larger triangle into two smaller ones like the top one, giving us three pieces that are shaded. But of course, with fractions, all of the pieces have to be the same size. So if I was to go ahead and just divide my hexagon into six of those larger triangles altogether... Now, the top and the bottom one have already been split in half for us in the first stage of this. I just need to make sure I go ahead and I split all of the other large triangles in half as well so that I have equal pieces, something very, very important for fractions. Now, if you were to go around and count these or just think to yourself, there were six large triangles all split into two. You now can see that I have 12 of these equal sized pieces and three of them are shaded. That gives us our answer of three twelfths. Another way to do this, some of you might have done this a bit quicker in your head without the visuals, is just to think, well, that large triangle was one sixth of the hexagon, and this smaller triangle being a half of it, therefore you know that's a twelfth, because the denominator doubles as the fraction gets half in size. If you were to add these two together, you might be able to very quickly understand that one sixth as an equivalent fraction is the same as two twelfths. Add them together, and hey presto, you get yourself three twelfths. A really cool question, one of my favorites. Now, let's go to the next one. We're gonna go back in time a little bit here to the 2022 SATs. I really loved this question because the maths involved here is not too tricky, the number work, but it was all about that lateral thinking, looking at the problem and knowing how to solve it. So why don't you have a go and see if you can get the answer before I explain it. So what information are we told here? Well, we know that the three triangles on the diagonal line equal 48. So we can start there. Because if I know they're all equal, because they're, they're all the same triangle, I can do 48 divided by 3, and I can get myself an answer here of 16. So straight away, I now know that all of the triangles are worth 16 from that first step. Awesome. I've got myself one mark. Now, this is where I see a lot of children getting stuck because they don't know how to work out the circles. Well, what do we know? Look, we know that the total of all the shapes is 200. So we know that the five triangles, one, two, three, four, five, plus the four circles, we know that makes 200, right? So we can start jotting down these ideas. Now that doesn't say 40, just to make it clear, this is my circle and this is my triangle. So we know what the triangles are worth and we know therefore if I've got five of them, I can do five times 16 to get myself 80. The way I did that so quickly, by the way, 10 times 16 is 180. So 5 times 16 must be half the amount. I can, I can half 160 to get 80 in my head quite quickly. So I know that the uh, triangles there equal 80 altogether, which means the four circles must equal 120 so that I still get my total of 200. So I'm one step closer now. I know that the four circles make 120. My final step must be this. 120 divided by 4 will give me the value of each circle. Fortunately, there's a nice times table fact there. 12 divided by 4 is 3, so 120 divided by 4 is 30, leaving me with a value of 30 for each of the circles. I love that problem. Now, I'm going to chuck in a bonus one. This isn't uh, in my top five. It's just very similar, and it reminded me when I saw this in 2022 of this 2018 question, because really, it's just algebra. All we just did there was a bit of algebra, but it's hidden in these kind of awesome visual problems. So bonus question here. Have a go at solving this one, and then we'll move on to my uh, next favorite question. So this is another awesome question because it's super visual, but if you write it down as algebra, it starts to make sense. You've got this figure here made with two hexagons and three of the ice cream cone sort of shapes. 
uh, and it makes 147. And then this one, with just one of the hexagons and three of the ice cream cone shapes, makes 111. And what this question is really trying to get children to do is see the difference between the two um, figures. So let me just show you what I mean. So two hexagons plus three, um, oh, that's supposed to be a cone. Let me do that again. That's dreadful. Ignore that, otherwise uh, Mr. Price will laugh at my drawings. We know that this makes 147, and then we know that just one hexagon and three of the ice cream cones makes 111. And what children are supposed to do is recognize that the only difference between these two equations that we've written is one hexagon. There is only one hexagon's difference, which means the difference between our two numbers here, if I were to subtract them and get myself 36 by subtracting them, then this number must be the value of that one hexagon that's different between them. Do you see what I mean? So therefore, we know straight away now that each hexagon is worth 36. Okay, so if I just focus on this second one, if I know that a hexagon is 36, I'm now left with 36 plus something equals 111. Now, this, this something is my three cones. So 36 plus three ice cream cones is 111. So first of all, let's work out what this total, this something is by doing 111 take away 36. Do it in your columns. Don't be afraid to just do this. Sometimes people do it in that, children do it in their heads because they're rushing. They think they've got to get it done, got to get it done, and they make a mistake. So just slow down and do it in your columns. Make sure you're right. 11 take away six is five. Zero take away three we can't do. We're going to exchange. 10 take away three is seven. So I know that this total value here is 75. I've got one step left. I've seen children write 75 here before and I'm like, oh no, you're so close, you're so close. But it's not quite right, is it? Because we know that three ice cream cones must have the value of 75 to make this whole equation correct. So what is each ice cream cone going to be worth? Well, we're gonna have to do 75 divided by three. Now the key mathematicians, hopefully that have learned their 25 times tables will immediately recognize 75 as being 25 plus 25 plus 25 by counting up in the 25s. So 75 divided by three is 25. If in doubt, do it in the bus stop, do your division there. So and there we are. If you wanted to check it, you could always go back to the first one and do 36 plus 36 plus 25, 25 and 25. And you will find that you will get 147, proving that you were correct in your working out. Pretty awesome, right? So before we move on to the next one, I've got a couple of words from our sponsor. Now, if you like solving mathematical problems, like I do, then you've got to check out brilliant.org. I've spent so much time on their website scrolling through interactive lessons in maths, computer science, and data science. And the reason I keep coming back is because each lesson is interactive and visual. I just find it so much easier to learn visually, and it's definitely something I always try to consider when teaching my own pupils. Work through a series of fun lessons which are tailored to suit your pace, and you can start with some simple topics, and before you know it, you'll have progressed onto some seriously tricky stuff. I personally recommend their number theory course if you want to get started with the basics. To try everything Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days, then just head over to brilliant.org slash tdtutoring, because we managed to secure our first 200 subscribers 20% off of that annual premium subscription. On to my third favourite question, the third hardest, I think, in the SATs in recent years, is from the 2022 paper again, and it is a coordinates question, and I just love this question, because, again, it's not too tricky, the maths, you just have to think outside the box. So why don't you have a little read, see if you can solve the question, come back for my solution. Did we work it out the same way? Two rectangles are identical, and as you can see, they're on a coordinates grid here with the x-axis and the y-axis labeled, but of course, they're not labeled with, with any numbers. That's part of our challenge. The, the length of each rectangle is three times its width. That's a really important fact. So if we can work out the length, then we could divide it by three to get the width, or if we can work out the width, we can times it by three to find the length. And that's really important because we can work out the width here. Now using this coordinate up here, what we've learned is that the X coordinate is minus two, and the other side of the rectangle is on the X axis, so it's at zero. That's just telling us our width. So we now know that the width of this rectangle is two. Two what? I don't know, but it's two. Now what we can do with this fact is times it by three to get the length. That means that the length of this rectangle must be six. Now I can transpose this information down to the bottom one, 
because we're trying to find the coordinate of P over here. So I now know something really interesting. I know that the length of this rectangle is six. So I know on my X axis, I'm going six across. I've got my first part of my coordinate. Now for the height, I know that it doesn't start at zero because this coordinate here tells me that we're starting here at one. So if I was trying to find this coordinate, it would be six, one for this corner. But of course, I'm not trying to find that corner. I'm trying to find P. And we know, don't we, that the width is two. So by going two higher, my coordinates will now change to six, three. Three is two higher than one. And there is my final answer. Such a great question because it just gets you to think uh, about how to solve this problem in lots of different ways. But the maths itself wasn't too tricky. That's, that is a sign of a good SATS question. Let's move on to number two. Two. Number two, really weird question. Never seen anything like this. It came up in the 2019 paper. I've not seen anything like it since and I've never seen anything like it beforehand. So it was quite a bizarre one. Very new for the children taking it that year. So I'm going to let you have a go at dividing this rectangle into two squares of different sizes and one rectangle, only using two straight lines to divide it up. Pretty tricky. Have a go. Maybe you can draw it out on a bit of paper or some square paper yourself and, and have a go. So there's actually a really cool solution to this problem, um, but it's super hard to understand. I think there's a reason that most children complained about this question uh, back in the day. Now, just bear with me here. Come on, come on my thought train with me. Come on my thought train. So if we've only got two lines that we can use to cut this up, two straight lines, then we've got to be really cautious of how we do this. It's got to make three shapes altogether. So first of all, that, that rules out doing this. If we, did, if we did one this way and one that cut completely through it, we're going to make four shapes. So we already know that there can't be any um, crossing over of the two lines that we make. Fair enough. Okay, let's go back to the drawing board then because that will make four shapes. And we just want to make two squares and a rectangle. Now the second rule we can understand is if we make our, with our first line, if we make rectangles, then we cannot solve the problem. Think about it. If we've only got one more cut to make now, is it possible in any scenario to make two squares? It's not, because if I put my cut here and I make a square there, the other side is a rectangle. You might think, okay, move it across a bit. Well, if I put it here, I've now made a square on the right, but a rectangle on the left. And if I do this, if I do the same thing in the top half, it, the same thing will happen. If I make a square up here, I've made a rectangle the, the other side. So it's completely impossible to make two squares if your first line only makes rectangles. So what that means is the first cut we make has to make a square. If you look at this, there's only one way to do that. The only square we could possibly make is a really big square by cutting down here. Now, you might be thinking, no, there's another way. And there is. If I didn't do it that side, I could have done the mirror image and done it this side. I have to leave two squares one side and five along the other side to make a really big five by five square. OK, so whichever way you whichever way you did it, it doesn't matter. It's just, a, you know, a symmetrical version of what I'm showing you here. So there's our first cut straight down the middle here. Now I've got one more line left now because I don't have to make two squares anymore. It doesn't matter if I make a square in a rectangle. That's exactly what I want. We're back to the problem at the start. But this time we only need one square. So if I cut here, I make a, a two by two square at the top, leave me with a three by three rectangle at the bottom. OK, and again, with symmetry in mind, I could have put my cut this side and made a two by two square at the bottom and a two by three rectangle at the top. But that's the only way you can do it. You have to make a five by five square, a two by two square and a three by two rectangle. And it could be the other way around if you're thinking about symmetry as well. Really cool problem. So many children struggled that year and, and really just it blew their mind. Um, but that's a proper problem, isn't it, guys? There's no there's no numbers involved, really. It's just problem solving, something that we really want you guys to master um, in your SATs. Right, on to uh, my last one then, okay? My number one, my favorite question. I love this. It came up years and years ago, 2017, this came up in the SATs reasoning paper. It was one of the last questions of the paper. So children were already a bit exhausted and this is what they were given. Cube A and cube cuboid B have the same volume, crucial to this question. And then they give you some dimensions and they tell you to calculate this um, missing length on B. So I'm going to let you solve the question and then you're going to come back and uh, I reckon I can show you a way of solving this that you did not think of. So make sure you stay tuned. Have a go. All 
Right guys, two mark question. Let me show you firstly the traditional way, the, the way that most children solve this. Then I wanna show you a way that thinks outside the box and you can get to the answer really quickly. And you'll be like, oh yeah, that's such a cool way of doing it. So here we go. First of all, same volume. So we know that to find volume, we do length times width times the height or whatever you label the three things. Maybe you call it depth or whatever. I'm gonna call it depth actually. Let's do length times depth times height. Why not? We, we multiply the three um, dimensions together. So with a cube, obviously that's nice and easy for us because the very definition of cube is that all of the um, all of the the edges are the same length. So it's going to be six times six times six, right? So I'm going to write this over here. The cube equals six times six times six, and we can work that out because six times six is thirty-six. If we multiply it by six again, which we can do over here, oops, don't need that line. Times by six, we're going to get twenty-one. 216 so we know that the volume for this one here is 216 centimeters cubed which means we know that this one is 216 centimeters cubed because they have the same volume now what children are supposed to do here is then work backwards and think to themselves okay so now we know that six times four times something which is our missing value is 216 centimeters cubed and we can use inverse we can use division to work backwards we could do 216 divided by 24 or we could do 216 divided by 6 get an answer and then divide that by 4 it depends if you want to divide by single digits or just dividing by um, a two digit number so let's do the one that most children would pick which is 216 they take one of the numbers first divided by 6 so 6 6 is into 2 doesn't go it goes across 6 is into 21 is 18 so 6 times 3 is 18 leaving us with 3 left over 6 is into 36 is 6 so that's interesting okay did we know this already just think about it for a second if you're thinking we've seen 36 before did we know this already am i wasting time i'll let you think about that where on the screen can we find this fact once we've divided it by 6 we take the answer and we divide it by 4 we don't need to do this in the bus stop because we know that 36 divided by 4 is nine, giving us an answer for that missing length here of nine. Six times four times nine is 216. So a couple of things, a couple of ways you can think outside the box here. Number one is if you were doing this traditional method, hopefully you would notice that 216 divided by six, we know is 36 based on the fact that we already worked out what the cuboid was where we ended up doing 36 times six is 216. So that might have sped you up a step here and then you could have divided by four in your head got very quickly to the answer. Let me show you one of my favorite ways to solve this. And I've seen one child think like this before and I thought that's a really good way of thinking about this problem. And this is what they did. They said, right, okay, we know that these two are equal in volume. So we know that six times six times six is equal to something times four times six, right? So what they did was they thought, well, if both sides times by six, then I'm just going to ignore those for a moment because I know that the other part, the part that I'm gonna circle, this bit must equal the same thing so that when I times them both by six, we get the same answer. So six times six, which is 36, has got to be the same as something times four. This also needs to equal 36. You following me? Because then both sides times by six and they get the same answer. Like these can't be different numbers. And then straight away, that child was like, okay, well, I know that nine times four is 36, so this must be nine, done. And they did the question in about 15 seconds, and I was, and I was flabbergasted, gobsmacked, you could say. Really impressive. So there you go. Maybe you didn't think about that. Maybe that was a bit too complicated. It doesn't matter, as long as you found a solution that you like and works for you. Anyway, thank you so much for joining me. Guys, it was a pleasure showing you, showing you my top five uh, hardest maths sats questions if you like this video leave us a comment and a like and subscribe and let us know what would you like to see more of in the future do you want more sats content we can do that how about some gtse content a bit scary but we can do that let us know what you want to see and i'll catch you in the next video